Atheist Nomads, episode 135, Geologic with George Traub. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, hi there, ho there. And joining us today is George Schraub of the Geologic Podcast and Blog, drummer from the Philadelphia Funk Authority, frequent MC at conferences like the Amazing Meeting, QED, and Australian Skeptics Convention, and... Also, I think the most frequent guest on the SGU. I think so. I don't know if Phil Plate has me beat, maybe, but I think I think it's me. I think I think I will take <laughs> that crown humbly. Hello, gents. How's it going? So, Hello, so why? Nomads. Why? Yeah. Why nomads? Why atheist nomads? What's the history of that name? Tell me. Explain it. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> uh, so okay, that'd be on on me in uh, the summer of two thousand seven when I was. Uh, about to drop out of the Seventh Avenue Theological Seminary, I was boring. Uh, spent <laughs> six weeks in Jordan, followed by three weeks in Mexico, where I was preaching an evangelistic series, and quit uh, four sermons in on that series, and left religion and uh, started my the rest of my journey to being an atheist. And when I was needing to find a screen name a little bit later for I don't remember what site it was. I was thinking about what to go with, and I really liked the uh, the nomads, like the the Bedouins. And I was in a temporary position, living in Tacoma, and likely to move. And I was getting antsy to move again. And I decided uh, I was going to go by DW Nomad Online. Started a blog, and then Wesley started blogging there, and then we started the podcast and called it Atheist Nomads. That's a hell of a travel agent to go from Jordan to Mexico. That's like, wow. <laughs> I had an overnight stay in Chicago God. between the two. Even yeah. better. Think of him like a grasshopper the trifecta. kung fu. What was really weird with that transition was the thing that shocked me the most. Well, okay, it went from dry air to humid air. And brown people had exposed limbs and men and women were holding hands instead of men holding hands with men. Well, as you do in the Middle East. That was that was what ended up seem, seeming weird to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that was it. That's when you said, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> God's not real. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I preached four sermons and didn't believe a single word and decided I couldn't keep doing it. God, so what's that like? So what's that like when you're like, what, an hour long sermon? Half hour? How long? Uh, they're about an hour. Hour long translator. sermon, right? Oh, with yeah. a translator. Oh, yeah, oh even yeah, better. So you get to, so you get to say the thing, and then they get to translate. So you get to like feel it, feel bad about it twice within your own <laughs> sermon. Oh, especially by the fourth one when my Spanish yeah. was not only had all come back, but was getting better, and okay. I was actually understanding most of the words the translator was saying. Right, hypocritico. Right, yeah, stuff like that. <sighs> Man, nice. yeah. Did an altar call. Nobody came forward and was like, okay, if I'm right, I am doing nobody any good here. And if I'm wrong, I'm also not doing anybody any good. I need to quit. What was, what was the topic of, was it the same topic for all four? Uh, or were they different? First, no, it was, uh, those were four parts in a 27 part series uh, okay. covering the yeah. Adventist message. And that first four sermons was really, well, first three was um, kind of the standard evangelical Christian message of, uh, we can know things because of the Bible and the Bible is accurate and uh, Jesus loves you and wants to save you from your sins and you are a terrible, terrible sinner. Right. Obviously. And then started going into more Adventist specific stuff of the end is nigh and you need to get ready. Oh, okay. Wow. And well, I, good. Yeah. good for you, man. All right. All right. How about you? You're raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Yeah, I was. I was out very quick, though. I knew. I knew very quickly that it was kind of a a bit of a a bit of a Ponzi scheme from the from the from I think age seven or eight. I kind of was really aware that this doesn't really make sense, and uh, no one's explaining this really well. And I'm only seven. Like, why am I? Why am I able to stump the priest? Why you know the the the, the, the priest that's that's supposedly working with this with this 
backup of, of 2000 years worth of knowledge and study can be yeah. stumped by this eight year old, nine year old, maybe 10 year old kid <laughs> and has to go, eh, some things we just don't know. And it's like, wait, no, <laughs> wait a minute. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm just, just post fetus and I'm stumping 2000 years of, of teachings. That's not, that's not cool. And then the hypocrisy of it all. And, and yeah, just realizing that plus I was an altar boy, uh, which then <laughs> oh. that really then doubly made it, made it, I, I was aware of the kind of hypocritical nature nature of the whole thing and how it really was just a show the altar being altar boy was great because it made church go by faster so there was that right. and then You're i busy. didn't have to i was busy and then also um i've told this story before but in my particular church in the ukrainian catholic greek right ch uh, church communion is distributed through a single communal spoon oh, no. which is yeah which is this sort of uh bacterial fiesta and uh literally everybody lines up and and one priest with one spoon dips it into the chalice uh, grabs the crouton and the wine and supposedly dunks it into everyone's mouth but no one people are putting their full mouth onto this thing so you're getting hundreds of people sharing this spoon just horrendous so as an altar boy worst case i would be like third or fourth in line so i was mm. just playing my bacteriological odds uh right. and then it also made the whole thing go by faster no, and no. Uh, i remember seeing the the huge amounts of money because we had to count all the money that was brought in um after each service and that also was just you know disheartening and disappointing seeing uh people um spending money they should not be spending on on this kind of stuff and and yeah just yeah very dis so i was out i was out quick and then once i was in college i uh i actually dated someone that was very religious and so i kind of uh read the bible cover to cover in English, um, cause I, again, I was Ukrainian Catholic, so I sort of, and, and we didn't, Ukrainian Catholics don't ever read the Bible. Um, apart okay, from like, I want to unpack that a little bit more. Ukrainian yeah. Catholic Greek rite. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's not like Orthodox, but it's, it's Ukrainian Catholic, which is like the Byzantine rite, but we recognize that the Pope is the head of the church. So the, right. the Byzantine Orthodox don't recognize the Pope, but for whatever reason, just that alone right there, like I had friends that I was in, uh, would go to camp with or was in Ukrainian school with, and like they, they were the non Greek rite. They were the Orthodox. And like just there, I was like, aren't like, wait a minute. We're already splitting off from each other. Like there's already this difference in what, what the God is supposedly okay with or not okay with. Like we are as, it's like that famous emo, emo uh, Phillips bit, you know, where he's on the bridge and he's about to jump and the guy, I'm not going to do any justice, but it's, it's, I think this was voted one of the best jokes of all time. But in essence, this guy is trying to prevent this other guy from killing himself. And he realizes that they have everything in common. They're both from the same state, the same city, the same town. They're the same religion. They're the same subset, the same subset until they get to this final, you know, are you the proctory of 1850? And he's like, no, I'm the proctory of 1870. And he no. pushes him off the thing. Die heretic, you know, <laughs> again, I'm not doing it any justice. Yeah, it's a great yeah. look up emo Phillips, you know, bridge religion joke. It's really, really funny, no, but it's so he, he true. Yeah, oh. it's so true. These like, these like minute, tiny differences that I would say, like, you know, why isn't my friend, you know, why isn't Mark from school at church here? And it would be explained to me, oh, well, he goes to the other Ukrainian Byzantine Catholic church that doesn't recognize the Pope, you know, and they, they use incense four times during the ceremony. We only use incense three times during the ceremony. And Did your we're priest right. Did your priest have a beard? No, no, no. It's not. It's not the guys with the Jiffy Pop hats and the and the <laughs> beards. Yeah, our guys. Our guys were clean shaven, and they didn't go for the hats. Okay, so they were more more Catholic, for sure. Yeah, so lots of gold, lots of incense, lots of lots of I icons, lots of uh, mosaic tile. Very big on the mosaic tile. Lots of beautiful mosaic. The big golden gates at the uh, at the front of the church. So, like you know, you can't. No one's allowed to walk through the center gate. Only the priest can. The the, the, the altar boys can't. We had to use the side gates. We'd get in some deep deep shit if we went through the center gate. That was like a that was a very very bad. You had to confess that sin if you walk through the middle. So again, it was all. But it was all smoke and mirrors. Like it was all like it and and behind the scenes you knew it was all smoke and mirrors so it was it was it was quite illuminating so between that and then actually reading the bible in english cover to cover wanting to impress this girl uh that's when i finally was like 
th- that that sort of solidified the whole deal. Where I realized, like, have you actually read this? This this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta add though, I I kind of kind of can echo what you're talking about. You know, I was raised Southern Baptist for a fair piece, and you know, all all of our heads of the Southern Baptist they have that giant convention, and you know, all of them are handshaking and getting along, and and then they all go back to their own church and. You know, our church, we we know, though, that every other Southern Baptist church is going to hell, too, because right. we're right. the only one that got it right. It's incredible. The, 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 the sheer sort of like, you know, pure balls of of presuming that your <laughs> your slight variation is the right one. It's amazing. Mm, I mean, it's 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 majestic, actually, in its kind of yeah, pure, pure, pure testicular fortitude. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, okay, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the the Ukrainian <laughs> Catholic Greek. Theologically, is it pretty much straight Catholic? I I guess, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. You know, it's funny. I I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you the the real minutia of the belief. You know, I knew what the services were like. Um, you know, and I know that I know that the the, the the Pope was recognized, you know, apart from that, I wouldn't even necessarily be even to tell you know, like I have Italian Catholic friends or Roman, Roman Catholic friends or whatever. And I, I, their services, services I would go to that would be in English. If I would happen to be in at a church service or something with a friend, uh, they were very different, much more conversational, um, much more, uh, yeah, just ours was very, very dark, very, a lot of the old traditions kind of sort of thrown in there. Okay. The, the, the old, mass? Not Latin, but but sort of based on the on the old uh, Slavic sort of it's called the Stadoslavyanske, which is the old Slavic, um, oh. not Ukrainian, not Russian, not not any of those. It's like like the the base language, though that still crept into it. So you know, I couldn't understand, even though I spoke Ukrainian so much, and it's all sung for the most part too, or at least sort of, sort of has this kind of sing songy quality to it. Um, so that you really don't understand what's being said. Um, hmm. plus the fact that you're in this echoey, you know, church that's covered in mosaic tiles. So there is this just drone yeah. nature to it all. So uh, also reading, reading the translation of the mass years later, uh, I was shocked at like that this is, you know, for, for whatever, 14, 15 years, I was sort of participating, even tacitly participating in this mass, uh, Saint Basil, Basil, I think was the guy that wrote that particular mass. Um, just, just, yeah, just horribleness. You know, the, 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 the best example being that, you know, like everything is repeated three times and then, and then, you know, while you're praying in this, in this litany of prayers that are being spread out, the hierarchy of the entire sort of pyramid scheme is laid out because it's like, first and foremost, we pray for the Pope. That's like the first thing. Then we pray for all the bishops and all the thing. Then we pray for all the the uh, metropolitan, the metropolitan priests. Then we pray for the other priests, and like, and then all the way down the list is like, then we pray for people that are sick or that need, you know, or hungry or whatever. And it's like really like the, the last bunch. That's who we're praying for at the end of this list. You know, the guy with the gold shoes, he's first. You know, that kind of stuff is just. It, it was it, more and more illuminating as I as I sort of investigated and and and. As as often is the case, the more you study religion, the more the more it's its own worst enemy in terms of sort of uh, allowing you to, to 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 leave it and realize the hypocrisy that's there. True study, you know, true unfiltered uh, study tends to sort of allow you to see what's actually going on and uh, and and provide, provides you an escape escape uh, vehicle. Man, at least Steve Martin, it just takes three times. I break with thee, I break with thee, I break with thee, and then you kick dog, dog poopy on her shoes and you're divorced. Right, but right. That's just too much. Yeah. I mean, Sundays were, you know, I had Ukrainian school on Saturday afternoons or Saturday mornings and then church on Sundays. And I like, by that point, I was just, I was beat. I was just like, can I have a morning? Can I please have one morning? You know, <laughs> 90 minute service, you know, of droning. So, yeah. And was it sit, stand, kneel, or just stand, kneel? Oh, no, full aerobics, sit, stand, kneel. Nice. Yeah, again, with, with I've said this before also, but the absolute, you know, and this occurred to me when I was about 13 or 14, you know, the absolute perfect representation of the hypocrisy of 
the Western church, or at least the Catholic church from my perspective is the, the padded kneeler. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like in mm-hmm. every pew, yeah. you have that little thing you pull down, which you kneel on, and it's got a nice little pad on it. So it's like, yeah. So, you know, I'm prostrating myself in front of the Lord, but you want to be comfortable. You know, <laughs> you, you want to, you want to save your knees. Like, and it's like, do you, do you understand the, 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 the weird dichotomy of that? Of like the point is to be uncomfortable and get, you know, to sort of, pay for sins or whatever you're doing, get on your knees, you know, but no, we're going to pat it. So that's, yeah, I always love that. <laughs> so were you kneeling on the tile? Oh no, I was, I mean, I was barely kneeling. And then it gets to the point now where if, if for whatever reason I am in a church, I don't, I don't even kneel and it's, it feels great. It feels really, I just sort of, <laughs> I, I, I stay, I stand cause I do that, but I, I will not, I will not prostrate on my knees in the, you know, in the same way that I don't wear a yarmulke if I go into a synagogue. Um, you know, it's like, I'm not going to participate in your most holy rites, you know, like I'll be there as an observer, uh, because it's my friend's wedding or because it's a funeral or whatever, but I'm not going to participate in the stuff, you know, it just feels about wrong that. to do it if you don't. It does. It, it does. I mean, I, at my, uh, I talked about this about my uncle's, my uncle's funeral uh, a couple of years ago, like everyone had to line up and, and the priest, uh, expected you to kiss the cross that he would hold again, this nice back to your logical adventure. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kiss, you know, even if I didn't have sort of the vehement beliefs that I have in terms of my atheism, I wouldn't want to participate in a sacrament of Mm -hmm. another organization, especially something that's, that's supposedly that holy, you know? So I, I, I kind of turned my head and, and didn't do it, you know? And it felt oddly, I don't know, liberating and, and kind of like, yeah. I mean, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a, a, a douchebag about it, but at the same time, I wanted to be like, do you realize how, how presuming this is? Especially at a funeral. It's not even like this is a service. This is like a funeral that is going to expect non, uh, uh, parishioners to attend because they're going to be, you know, coworkers, non Ukrainians, especially, you know, this is a Ukrainian church of a funeral of a, of, you know, of my uncle, he's going to have his coworkers. He's going to have his, his, you know, he could have all kinds of religiously or not religiously minded or varying faiths there. And, you know, to presume that everyone's going to line up and kiss the cross as they walk past the casket. It was just, uh, it was awful. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and I attended a uh, Catholic service for a uh, church worship ministry class when I was in college that the uh, priests actually, did a little speech before communion saying that if you weren't a good Christian in good standing or you were an apostate to not come forward because it'd bring a curse on you. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> well, Hey, I'd much rather hear that yeah. than, than feel some like, you know, duty of like, Oh, you're going to be embarrassed if you don't get up, you know? <laughs> Cause it, right. if they take it seriously, they should not be encouraging people to take part. Absolutely. Of the, of the sacrament like that too, the mo- I mean, that is, that is the whole ball of wax right there. You're going to eat this flesh and drink this blood just mm-hmm. casually because everyone else is doing it. It's like, whoa, really? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you just bring up one of those little tiny travel bottles of like Tabasco and say, Hey, you know, for my cracker. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. But the, the Catholic and, and Orthodox way of, of doing things, the, the amount of physical, involvement you have with the communion every time with all of the kneeling and standing and aerobics and going forward and going back and kissing things. There is a powerful element to actually engaging your body in it that can really strengthen its, its holding power. Oh, of course. That's, I mean, that's the whole point. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. I mean, it's all about, especially in the Catholic, especially the Byzantine Catholic thing, this idea of representing, you know, this is the trailer, this, this whole, this whole religious thing, this is the trailer for heaven. This is the preview. This is the sneak peek of what's awaiting you. And that's why it's all covered in gold. And that's why there's all this magisterium and all this, all this mystery, you know, and yeah, you're going to be in vine. Look at, I mean, this is what heaven's going to be like. This is just, this is just the preview. You know, we don't even get to see the Hulk turn into the Hulk yet. This is just the trailer, you know, of what's coming up in the feature that's going to be heaven, you know? Um, 
So yeah, you got to You got to involve the body. You've got to involve, you know, all that kind of stuff that reinforces, you know, that, that idea that if you actually make yourself smile physically, you feel better, Mm -hmm. you know, now they obviously don't, you know, the church didn't understand the, the biomechanics of that, but, they understood that there was a definite correlation and a connection to it. So, yeah. So if you're kneeling in front of something, if you're prostrating yourself, if you're standing, if you're singing, if you're, I mean, just crossing yourself, you know, these little, these little superstitious things that you gotta, you gotta do this stuff. It horribly reinforces itself. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's addicting. And then it's just in the same way that you knock, knock wood, you know, when you say something or whatever it is, it's that same exact part of the human brain, which is trying to correlate, you know, small incidences to some greater thing, which, cause then it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable in the, in the void that is existence. See, but the church is like the, the Anglies Hulk, you know, there's a whole lot of graphics and like no <laughs> yeah. substance at all. Right. Whereas right. life is more like Deadpool and it's still like, just like awesome and ma- magnificent. I just saw Deadpool Dirty. four hours ago. I yes. loved it. Very awesome. fun. Very fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't laughed that many times. I've laughed out loud a bunch recently, but I haven't. I don't think I've laughed that many times out loud at a film in a, in a number of years, and it was very, very, yeah, very enjoyable. Very gratifying. I just loved it. I mean, they did a really wonderful job. I'm very yeah. happy. Can't wait to see the next. Did you? Yeah. See, did you stay to the end for the stinger? Of course, okay. of course. And I actually called it in my brain. I thought. I, for whatever reason, I thought Ferris Bueller. Maybe, maybe that was just because that's the most famous one. And I always think that subconsciously whenever I'm hanging out afterwards, totally. but I did think Ferris Bueller. And then as soon as I saw the robe, I just thought, Oh, that's great. That's <laughs> fantastic. Spoiler, by the way. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was so amazing. Loved it. Start to finish. <laughs> yeah. Well cast, really fun, self aware. The fourth wall thing wasn't too much. That can get kind of too much if it's done not not right i loved that you know they covered his eyes for what three quarters of the film and it totally worked i mean to his credit to ryan reynolds credit to be able to be completely covered in that suit and be and be comfortable and still have enough of the character kind of come through in what in essence is a you know vocal performance um yeah it was very very satisfying totally he rocked it (laughs) yeah dustin probably hasn't seen it Oh, we, I did, and we talked about it in the last episode. Oh, that's right. That's right. You hate the fourth wall. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, thought no. three times was enough, and every time past that just pulled me out of the story. Oh, yeah. And ruined it now, for me. Now, have you read Have you read the comic? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Exactly. So that's, yeah, that's like an essential part of the actual... It, it was a movie yeah. made for fans of the comic. Not like most of the superhero movies that are made for the general public. Yeah. <laughs> now, yes, a lot of people from the general public did enjoy it, but that wasn't the target audience for sure. I don't know. It's racking up some good sales. And it was an awesome rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, All right. Well, we're going to take our first break. Oh, boy. <laughs> Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. All right, George, when I interrupted your story, it was to, to go into more details about your, your, the church of your, your upbringing. Uh, you were talking about dating a very religious girl in college. Yeah. What, yeah. Start with what flavor uh, of church that she was with? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was a, she was a born again Christian. And I think a Calvinist, is that what it was locally here? Mm-hmm. Mennonite, Mennonite Calvinist. Oh, that's right. You're up in PA. Okay. So oh, yeah, okay. I'm in, yeah, I'm here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So, which is where I went to college as well. So she, uh, yeah, she was an amazing singer and I kind of uh, was, was quite, um, attracted to her voice. She, uh, not only sang classical music really well, but she was very interested in, in performing jazz and she had an excellent jazz voice. So that was, uh, yeah. And kind of the, the religious thing was sort of secondary 
Uh, but then it became kind of a fun, um, uh, distraction almost, or like a project in a weird way. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but she did have a, she had a good voice. At least a good smoky jazz voice. It wasn't a smoky voice, but it was a very pure, um, and very, uh, well-trained voice. So she had kind of this classical training, but she could turn off the classical tone. Uh, like a lot of other singers, especially other singers, our contemporaries at school couldn't do. You pretty much, people could do either or, and she could do both really well, which I'm, I've always been, uh, interested and fascinated by people that can sort of do multiple genres, uh, correctly. Like in my, hmm. in my drumming, I always, I, I would hope that I could play some of the most fun days I've ever had performing, uh, have been multiple gigs where in the morning I'm playing a jazz brunch. Or I'm doing, you know, Dave Brubeck covers, and in the afternoon is a uh, a festival with a uh, you know a hard rock trio playing, uh, you know, police tunes and and, and ACDC songs, and then at night doing um, a classical concert or doing you know funk songs where I'm doing Motown and R and B, and have the playing be you know stylistically as accurate as it can be, as 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 much as I can possibly hope it to be. That to me is the fun. The fun thing. And, you know, the word, uh, not that I am, but the word virtuoso is thrown around a lot. And a true virtuoso can play on their instrument in any sort of style. So uh, that to me is really exciting and appealing. And she was, she had for, for her lack of experience in terms of the, in, in, in performing jazz, she, she could really turn, turn on that part of her vocal, uh, training and turn off the part that would, would interfere with that. And that was very attractive to me. Badass. And then it was like, you know, and I was this, I was this bad, you know, bad student atheist guy. So there was a, there was a mutual sort of, uh, opposites attraction thing going on. Yeah. So you were the bad boy. All right. In in some ways. Yeah. But, but, you know, I was the bad boy, uh, you know, in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, it was, it was tempered, you know, like I knew how to behave in front of parents, but I was, yeah, but I still, I had the, I had the bad boy ideas happening anyway. So yeah, it was, it was mutually uh, beneficial for a while until it wasn't, <laughs> but I did get to read the Bible top to bottom. So that was good. Nice. And you did that for her. Well, it was, yeah, I was sort of trying to, trying to involve myself in her world somewhat. And, uh, um, yeah, and then trying to convince her that uh, that that uh, our that we could proceed in some in some way, even though there was no way we could. But I was trying to convince both myself and her that we could do it, and that was one one way that I was trying to convince her. I would you know read stuff and we talk about it, but but it you know it 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 did much of the opposite, where it was just like, <laughs> have you read the Old Testament? This is some horrible, stuff. and then like and the New Testament isn't that much better, really. This is some this is some bad stuff, man. And then mm-hmm. this doesn't make, this contradicts this, and then this doesn't make sense with this other thing. And they said this before, but now they're saying this. Like, which one is it supposed to be? Yeah, so. It, it's a lot like comic books they're always trying to reinvent stuff or like ignore the past that didn't happen and yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's cool. yeah yeah which again that's it's like it's storytelling you you know you recognize that this is you know what it is it is storytelling and this is you know in the same way that the iliad and the odyssey i mean we could have just as easily had a religion based on that yeah, or on a cool one yeah, or Gilgamesh, sure. <laughs> who knows what? You know, these are just stories that have been repackaged and and are prone to all of the same fallacies as uh, and 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 delicate human failings as any other stories, especially ones from a Bronze Age culture. So yeah, uh, we actually do have a religion that's loosely based off of the Odyssey. Do we? Christianity. The oh, okay. Gospel of Mark is written with Jesus and stories about Jesus following the Odyssey formula that the author would have learned Greek writing. Hmm. The main way they taught Greek back then was, or how to, how to read and write it was reading the Odyssey and writing the Odyssey and then writing stories in the style of the Odyssey. And he wrote a gospel following the plot of the Odyssey. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, a, a uh, one of the best explanations for uh, for okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. Or is that the strength of sort of human storytelling tends to follow these, you know, Conradian uh, arcs, you know, 
Um, is that something that's baked into our brains in terms of how you tell a story? I think it's more there are certain stories that survive and inspire. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Odyssey did that for the ancient world. A lot of Shakespeare does that now. Mm -hmm. And right, right. when you get some of those stories, like how many different tellings of Hamlet are there? In, in different forms and stories that it's not about Hamlet, but it's the same story. Sure, yeah. What was it? They say there's there's seven plots basically, or something. Yeah, something like there's like nine. <laughs> there's nine plots. Yeah, sure, sure. The basic but, yeah, romantic I, comedy dates back to to ancient Greece. Right, right. But I wonder how many of those things are sort of baked into us from you know sitting around the campfire, even yeah. even even that there's even a more basic. You know, maybe there's maybe there's really two stories. You know, you either stay home or you leave. You know, some, and that's it. There's like the variations of those or what, you know, whatever it may be. So yeah, mm. I wonder if it's a coincident, not coincidental, but it's an incidental similarity between the Odyssey and what those writers were doing or, uh, as opposed to like, Hey, I'm going to use the outline of the Odyssey to do it. So, but I've never heard that before. I have to look into that. That's interesting. And yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it because there's so much that's borrowed from previous mm -hmm. cultures, you know, the flood myths, the resurrection myths, the virgin births, all, I mean, it's all just, it's, yeah, it's the same resurrected stories over and over, kind of repackaged, repolished, which is, we're still doing today until mm -hmm. you get oh, Deadpool yeah. talking to the camera. So, oh, well, there's, I, I heard recently about, uh, it was, uh, either how stuff works or stuff you missed in history class, one of those two podcasts. They were talking about fairy tales and like the traditional fairy tales, there's somebody who's doing work tracing their lineages back and a lot of them based on where they find the same story more or less uh, probably date back to having been originally told or written in Indo-European like proto-Indo-European mm -hmm. dating back that far sure yeah, yeah I wouldn't doubt it look we're, we're it's 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 incredible how much we are the same exact animal that we were what <laughs> 60,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. I mean, we're just, we're identical. We're identical. We wouldn't, you know, mm -hmm. if you were to transport one of us in time and put us on the savannah, you know, you wouldn't stand out. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, apart from your iPhone, you wouldn't stand out, you know? I mean, it's, it's, and we forget that, 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 that those pre cultures that were formulating all that stuff had the same sized brain, had the same capacity. And had the same wants and needs and desires and, and ability to formulate all the same stuff we do now. It's just mm -hmm. we, we tend to, you know, now we can build upon the knowledge that's come before because we've got writing, you know. Totally. But it, It's but just accumulated knowledge. I mean, Accumulated, uh, yeah. And yeah. But it's incredible that the animal is ident identical. So, of course, they're going to be, you know, looking at the stars and thinking. That's why, like, I think I – think skeptics and atheists and science-minded and evidence-based – people and mm -hmm. creatures have been around since since the absolute dawn uh, and for whatever reason because the repositories of knowledge tend tended to be uh, based around you know religious uh, institutions i think that's why we got sort of the short shrift in the in the historical records but i think people were were just as suspicious of the shaman you know uh, doing some kind of a trick with a, you know, <laughs> a lit stick. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're just, you know, whatever, 10, 15, 20% of them were just as eyebrow raising and going, wait, wait a minute. What? No, nah, that's bullshit. Wait a minute. As, as we are today, I, I'm convinced of it. And I think, I think that's one of the most sort of interesting and fascinating things about our, our past, uh, uh cultures is to investigate that 20% that was saying, uh, no, you know, oh. Jennifer Hecht had that great book called doubt that, uh, uh, talks about how there is this thread throughout all of civilization of people going, um, wait, what? And it's so, it's so encouraging and wonderful. I've always thought that, you know, if you didn't have the, the church pimping afterlife all the time and getting so many donations and, you know, if we had some more, you know, maybe science sleep, more uh literate people in in science or read even reading back in the you know a few centuries well michelangelo probably wouldn't have been making great works for the church he might have still been doing great things for 
well, you know, sciencey things. Sure. I mean, well, if, mm-hmm. if the whole if the caliphate hadn't changed in whatever that was, I, I don't know the exact dating, but in terms of the the advances that were being made in the Middle East, in terms of uh, uh, math, mathematics, oh, yeah. and chemistry, algebra, all that stuff. That, th- those advances were, were crazy. And, and they, they basically stopped because the, the, no, no, it was before the oh. crusades. It's when, it's when the caliphate changed and mm. it changed from this acceptance of science and acceptance yeah, of giant distrust of it to a giant. Yeah, it sort of, I mean, it, it was almost within a generation. It sort of turned on a dime where that stuff wasn't encouraged anymore. And if, if yeah. that hadn't happened, that, that part of the world would have been 1500 to 2000 years ahead of where we are today technologically because you wouldn't have had sort of the loss of all of that stuff it wouldn't have had to sit dormant for whatever that was 900 1200 mm-hmm. years until europeans came back and found all this stuff oh, uh, goodness, you know, just the, look at iran i mean from 1960 oh, yeah. it was kind of hard to tell it apart from oh, that America. too jeez now, yeah so that's especially in the 70s it was just mm-hmm. the jobs <laughs> everywhere no, I saw, I saw Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson did a great talk at Tam years ago and he did the keynote and he talked about this, this sort of loss, this, you know, there's, there's a billion Muslims on the planet now. And he says, like, how many Einsteins are in that billion? Yeah. Not that are, you know, actively Einsteins, but are the equivalent of Einstein. Just from a pure mathematical perspective, there's got to be a bunch. You know, and yet mm-hmm. it's not being fostered, let alone the billions that have lived and died uh, in the last 2,000, 3,000, three and a half thousand years. Um, the, the scientific geniuses that were, that kind of came and went because the environment and the culture was not designed to foster that. You know, think of the achievements again, just from a pure mathematical and statistical standpoint. If, you know, Einstein comes along, what? One in half a, one and a half a billion people, one in a, one in five billion people is an Einstein or is a, uh, whatever the, you know, equivalent would be. Um, mathematically that has to happen if you have five, six, ten billion people that have lived at some point. And his, his point was like, yeah, if this hadn't changed, think of the advances. And, and isn't that something we should be working on to like to be inclusive, to allow those statistical geniuses to, to be, to reach their potential. It was a really cool way to look at it. Well, and what really sucks with that is it could have changed if not for the Crusades, which made them even more distrustful of everything. And then Genghis Khan came in and literally burned down the universities. Yeah. Yeah. They but, still yeah, but, haven't recovered from that. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But I think even before that, they were... They had, oh, they yeah, had they lost. were definitely... It's, Definitely started way before, but whatever yeah. trends were going on, it was just completely solidified. And within a 500 year time span, they were stuck. Yeah. There was no coming it's, back from that. It's, it's actually amazing that, that as much of that knowledge was sort of retrieved as it was during the Renaissance and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that it was allowed to, that's also a, a pretty interesting that the sort of the educational and, and advancing uh, environment allowed for that kind of classical mm-hmm. training to be rediscovered and embraced and and advanced upon. It's, it's, it's again, it's like two steps forward, you know, <laughs> fifteen steps back sometimes. <laughs> but when you get those two steps, it feels really great. And then all of a sudden, that also proves the the appeal and the and the facility that science and the scientific method has within it inherently that if it's allowed to foster like get out of the way because boy it's just going to take off Mm -hmm. it's pretty cool oh yeah it's pretty cool look at 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 medieval europe they uh burned all the the ancient philosophy and science burned the books the renaissance a lot of it was thanks to copies of of the greek philosophies preserved by arabs right right Exactly. Yeah, and we probably so, wouldn't even know much about Hypatia at all if if it hadn't yeah. been for them. Yeah, it could have been another another thousand years before that stuff was sort of rediscovered or refigured out. So yeah, no, it's 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 amazing. But that, again, that's the strength of the you know of the process and the method, which which again conflicts and contracts contrasts with finding ancient religious texts. 
you know, like the Dead Sea Scrolls or, or the Apocrypha or whatever, or you, you might find some, some ancient religious, um, text, uh, relic or something. And it's like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> but there's no advancement made mm -hmm. within the philosophical understandings of what the religion is supposedly trying to achieve. Whereas only, with science, like you find some old science formula or you find some, some old scientific method or you find, you know, Greek, you find, uh, uh, you know, the writings of Pericles or you find the Pythagorean theum, theorem buried in a, in a, you know, clay pot somewhere, you know, it will advance exponent. It still works. Yeah. There's this exponential mm -hmm. advancement in terms of architecture and mathematics and all this kind of stuff that would, you know, that is inherent within the, the validity of the, the discovery that's there as opposed to some kind of, Oh, you know, story about begatting. <laughs> yeah. Although what it's sucks like with Pythagoras. Yeah. They found his theorem. They also found his metaphysical writings Mm. Which would have been just as destructive as any other religious text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fortunately, but, you know, that one didn't take hold. <laughs> right. What? 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 You know, the, what rises? You know, the the the, the cream yeah. gets to the top, and it's like, hey, wait, we can actually use this to build bridges and shit. So it's like, okay, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, there's, like, there's been some really famous inventors over time that thought they could turn lead into gold too, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but that but they couldn't, you know. So you you discover those writings and you try you try to replicate using the process. You replicate their experiments and it doesn't work. And you go like, all right, this doesn't work. Yeah. Eventually, we will be able to, but it'll be completely pointless because yeah, it'll cost right. so much money to split off that many protons. Uh, it, right. It, well, it won't matter then because we won't be using money then. I, I <laughs> because Star Trek. That's right. Pressed latinum. <laughs> gold press latinum mm -hmm. yeah star trek currency would not exist without uh without gold mm -hmm. even if it is just the casing <laughs> i don't know we'll find a way maybe i don't know <laughs> <laughs> people just find ways to make that show just count and like they're they're fucking uh building tricorders or trying to i mean there's an x prize for that as i recall mm-hmm that's right. I think we'll get there before we realize we have it. And it'll be so much better. Well, maybe not quite. Some of it I don't know if we'll quite get to. Like some of that <laughs> scanning capability. But uh, give us time. We're already getting pretty close to being able to do that with a smartphone. Yeah. A lot of that. It's always so in incremental. It's always incremental. And so the incremental, the incremental change is never quite as drastic as the sudden, mm -hmm. you know, invention, invention in your hand or the fictionalized version of the thing. Whereas you get, you get with, you know, 10% of the thing and then you get 22% of the thing and then 40% of the thing. And then before you know it, you've got 98% of the thing, but it's not nearly as cool as just having 98% of the thing. Yeah. But that's always the way it works. It's always like, oh yeah, we totally have these things like, you know, like, like the smart smartphones perfect example oh you know, sure it's well, it's, it's great an evolution but mm -hmm. it's an evolution yeah and you sort of realize wow like this gosh in my hand i have you know more more information available than you know president clinton had access to mm -hmm. but, Liter but literally then like <laughs> then again a uh, cat uh, caterpillar company just put out a smartphone that has a uh, integrated FLIR, you know thermal imaging in it mm. oh kind of nice wow yeah. Odd, but, yeah, and, you know, yeah. where I think it's really going to take off isn't going to be with like going the tricorder route. It's going to be, at least for medicine, uh, bionics. Can't you wait. have a monitor inside of you that reports the data back and can provide so much better information. If you can read hormone levels and chemical levels, you've got 90% of the data. Right. The yeah, only thing more you would ever need would be the occasional scanning. Yeah, I think you'll have you'll have n nanobots, f you know, swimming through you that'll be able to report to a centralized device. 
saying that, you know, oh, there's a blockage here or there's a temperature change here or there's an enzymatic problem over here. And well, yeah, just it'll, be able it'll to you know, repair that blockage. And then, yeah, and then just repair it too. On That'll top be the next it, yeah. generation we'll be able to repair. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Keep all your, your, uh, uh, man, I just blanked on that word. Veins all cleaned out and <laughs> right. your pancreas working and yeah. All right. So commercial break? Uh, we've missed too many. Nah, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in the third one now. <laughs> if you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. All so, right. Do you think of the kittens? What you been up to lately? I mean, you're what have I been up? Incred- yeah. I mean, I. I I, it was a couple months ago, but I just heard you on Incredulous. That's all. I did that. Yeah, that was a couple months back. I did that. Uh, yeah, it's a slightly slow time now for the for the band. Uh, I had a premiere of uh, the Broad Street Score, which I did back in January. That was a kind of a greatest hits twentieth anniversary concert, um, which was oh, yeah. a yeah, it was a string quartet ver- string quartet versions of songs of mine that I've written over the last twenty hmm. years. Uh, that's something wow. I'm going to be doing at Nexus, actually, which is going to be really fun. May 12th, Thursday, May 12th at the Northeast Conference for Science and Skepticism. I'll be doing the New York premiere of that piece, um, which will be really fun. Uh, so yeah, just plugging away. And I just uh, had the ninth, my ninth year of uh, podcasting episode 450. I'll record tomorrow. So wow. Mm hmm. There you go. Holy crap. I thought we were doing good. What are you like? 134, 35? This is 135. <laughs> okay. Nice. Nice. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. 450. Yeah. You go, man. Here's yep. another 450. Yeah. 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 I never thought, never thought I'd get, I'd get to here. Not that I was ever even wanted to, but, uh, but yeah, somehow nine years later, it's crazy. First episode was, uh, you're one of those amazing, uh, first generation podcasters. I think I don't know. If, yeah, I guess I'm first generation. Just yeah, just there's a couple guys that have a. I mean, like the SGU had their 10th anniversary, and there's another guy that's been doing it for I think like almost 12 years. But yeah, I was I was in pretty early. Yeah. Did you did you actually get inspired by the SGU, or did you just like get into it? No, I I was inspired by skepticality originally, nice. um, and by my friend Slough. Slough is uh, uh, the guy that uh, I record all my albums at his studio. He's an engineer. He's a musician and a composer as well. And uh, he's visually impaired. So he was on the podcast train mm. right from the beginning because pretty much all of his sort of entertainment is done through audio. So he suggested I listen to skepticality and, uh, which I did. I sent them some stuff. They interviewed me and that kind of started it. And then a year or so later after that, he sort of said, Hey, you should really do one of these. And so I thought, okay, I could probably do one of these. So let me give it a shot. I'll do 50 and I'll see what happens. And here we are nine years <laughs> later. Well, you do wow. give really good voice. Oh, thank you. Man. And you started well before that college days. Uh, you started what as a DJ? I had a little, a little silly radio show. Like, you know, that's kind of the rule when you go to college, you have to have a radio show. So I did that. Um, yeah, just kind of talking about stuff. Yeah. Pre, pre podcast podcast, I guess. Um, playing tunes occasionally, but then just sort of talking about things, telling stories. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was Tuesday nights after astronomy class. I remember I'd fall asleep in astronomy class, wake up just in time for that to end and then go do my, go do my show at, uh, WMRC. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> I, I slept Never. in astronomy class as well. It was tough because yeah. it was at night, you know, it was like late. So like, you know, I'd be, I'd be shot from the day and then you'd have a, like, I think we had a two and a half hour astronomy class. I just be, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I remember like, Mine just, was oh. only 50 minutes and it was at 11 o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. All right. But the, really? the teacher was pretty boring and he would turn off the lights and it was in this big auditorium. Yeah. With like 30 people in there and I couldn't stay awake. 
That's it. At that point, he's just daring you to sleep. Come on. Right. Yeah. Lights go off. That's it. And I would do my homework and then fall asleep. Yeah. (laughs) I would sit and write out uh, Frank Zappa lyrics to stay awake. So I just had notebooks full of, I would think of every (laughs) possible Frank Zappa and yes, lyric I could, I could remember and just write them out. And just so it looked like I was taking notes, but I was just sort of transcribing from memory what I could. And that would keep me awake. Um, Yeah. It's a good use of my parents' money. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Man. man, oh man. All right. So <sighs> I'm still tense. Anyways. I'm too tense. Sometimes Why are you I'm, tense? Oh, just uh writing. Uh, uh I, I just got into motorcycle riding, so I'm like full on motorcycle riding. So this is I don't know. It's what kind of do. what kind of bike? What, what are you, like this motocross or uh, Harley's I, or what? It it, it uh, reminiscent of Harley. I don't know. You call it a cruiser. Um, it's okay. a 2005 uh, Kawasaki Vulcan. Uh, kind of a big bike, it's mid mid size, I suppose, for a cruiser. About 500 pounds, 800 cc, and it's all kind of fun. But um, going from a scooter to that, really, it's a bit of a jump. What kind of scooter do you have? Uh, Vespa clone. Uh, it's oh, called, really? Yeah. Uh, it's called a genuine Stella and yeah, it looks like a little Vespa PX. Oh, it's I've awesome. seen those. Yeah. 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 I, I've, I've wanted a Vespa for a long time and just haven't quite gotten around to getting one, but, oh, uh, my goodness, they're so much fun. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. It, it's silly. It's fun. I get about 90 miles to a gallon. Maybe yeah. Like over. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Honda's got a really cool little Vespa ish kind of, I forget what it's called. Mm. Uh, I almost got one of those. There, there's a guy around town that drives one and I just, there's just something about it. It's just really nice. So yeah, I would totally, totally get one of them. I don't mind being that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people that ride scooters somehow have a stigma to me, but, or at least they did when I was growing up. I like, I always mm-hmm. like that, but I don't want to be that guy. And right. now I, I give zero fucks. I, I like being that guy. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I, even, why not? I even strapped a little milk cart to the back. Nice. Yeah, so awesome. why did you, why did you decide to go up to the bike? Uh, well, highway riding that's a big thing. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, long periods, go on big rides, maybe down the uh, coast one hundred and one. Nice. Do you need a license yeah. for that, or is that a separate thing? How's that work? Uh, for at least in Washington State, um. As I recall it, it's 150, well, 149 CC and below. You do not need a motorcycle endorsement. Okay. But uh, I got mine anyways. And is it like a test? Is that a, dr- a driving test or how does that work? Or is that a written thing or a combination? Uh, personally, I took a uh, basic riders course for motorcycles. And then that you have a, a actual motorcycle driving test and a written test at the same time. And while driving, uh, oh my gosh, that must be tough. It ain't that bad. You know, you, you <laughs> no, just learn to balance. Right. And then, yeah, you just uh, show show a little card to the DMV and pay them cool. a little bit of extra money. And there you go. Ah, hmm. Nice. Nice. All right. But one thing that's probably a factor in him deciding to uh, upgrade like that would be the fact that between him and his girlfriend, there's a bridge. And it's the only way across the water. <laughs> And it's on. It's a freeway. That is oh, true. Oh, I see. All right. True. All right. And it's the famous Tacoma Narrows Bridge with some insane winds, and I would be terrified to go across that thing on a scooter. That is true. Have you ever seen those old, old movies of the galloping Gertie, the bridge? Just oh, yeah. Walking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's this bridge. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, granted, you know, the, taking it down, replaced it, but yeah. <laughs> So you increase your CC so you can get some more C. That's very nice. <laughs> not to cast aspersion on your girlfriend. No, 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 no. That's, that's no. terrible. Sorry. No. Apologies to her and her family. <laughs> uh, oh boy. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. 
So what kind of hobbies do you have? What do you like to do? Hobbies. Gosh, who has time for hobbies? It's funny. Um, yeah, you're no. always I, working out. You're always doing playing. But. That's the thing. Yeah. It's like if I have free time, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to try to write a song. I'm going to try to go for a walk. I mean, I love, I love walking. I just, any chance I get to be outside and go into the woods somewhere, like I, I think that might be a, considered a hobby. Uh, I guess what movies going to films, uh, is, is a hobby, I guess. I don't know. I've always wanted to, I always wanted to build trains. I always wanted to have a train set. I never had a train set and I picture myself at some point in the next 20 years having a train set. So when I do that, I will let you know because that'll be the official hobby. I want to make a an HO scale, oh, yeah. you know, perfectly two scale. I don't know. Maybe I'll make a little miniature Bethlehem or something. But uh, I always loved uh, train sets that were all that were done right, that were to scale. Uh, you know, I, that I, I used to make model airplanes and tanks and stuff when I was a kid and I'd make little dioramas. I was like that, but I haven't, I haven't flexed those muscles in quite a long time. So maybe at some point, uh, you know, once, uh, once the music industry totally dies, I'll be able to, uh, <laughs> once the live music industry totally folds in upon itself, uh, and is, and is swallowed <laughs> by a DJ, a Godzilla sized DJ. I'll, uh, I'll make a little train set here and that'll be fun. But, uh, yeah, otherwise it's, it's, you know, reading the books, going on hikes, doing what push ups and jumping rope, and then, uh, trying to become a better guitar player and a better piano player and a better drummer and a better singer. Those are my hobbies. Very nice. <laughs> well, you're pretty much kicking my ass already. So <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're, you're seriously always busy and you know, the world's better for it. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Well, come on, you're you're kind of a hero of mine, so I'm fanboying a little bit. Dude. Oh my gosh, that's very nice. Oh. Now, how did you? I'm always curious. How did you? How did you discover my my stuff, my junk here, as it were? Well, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, uh, just searching for uh, skeptic or atheist podcasts. Oh, really? Uh, but I've also picked up a fair piece of about music over over the years, also because of you. Uh, and granted, I don't play at all, but I find it interesting and it's, you know, it really helps me, uh, have a lot, a lot better conversations with my girlfriend actually, cause she loves the indie music. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. It's always a fun challenge to try to explain musical things to in, in non-musical ways, you know, non-specific or non-technical ways. It's always a, I don't know. There's some, there's something. It's like a weird puzzle, you know, to be able to to d describe or explain a musical concept. You know, like um, uh, holding your your uh, sticks when you're when you're drumming. There's like the of, over and under is the was what I understand. I guess. Yeah. Did I talk about is that a reference to something I said? Or yeah, I'm not even sure. But you know, it's that it's that sort of thing of like, oh, well, this is yeah. Ima you know, imagine a, a wall of bricks and the alternating bricks or something. You know, like to explain some kind of musical musical concept without using musical terms is uh, is always fun. And I, I I I've been surprised that I probably say half of the questions I get on the segment called Ask George on my show is which is just a question an answer thing are musically related people asking, you know, what is this thing I heard? What's going on in this song? Or, or what do you think about this artist? Or what do you think about this album or whatever? Uh, I never quite expected to, for that to be as much of what I talked about in that segment, that and, and clothing. It's funny that <laughs> it's almost half and half, half clothing, half music. So, which is, I'm totally fine with, but that has been a surprising thing. So I, I'm glad you've, uh, you've been able to communicate more with your girlfriend about music, if only yeah, slightly because of what I've done. So that's great. I've also learned to wear bright socks. Very so nice. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Excellent. <laughs> well, then my job is done. Yes. Now I can build trains. Joss Whedon, Much Ado About Nothing. Have you seen it? No, I did not. And I meant to. I think I had even rented it once and then didn't get around to, to actually watching it. But uh, uh, I heard it's very enjoyable. It, Nathan Fillon, everybody, cast is amazing. Yeah. See it. Okay. I don't know if it's on Netflix, but I'll, I'll, I'll go hunt for it. That'll be a nice <laughs> Sunday afternoon at some point. Yes. Now, what do you, what do you like most about it? I love that uh, they 
this was just a, 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 a bunch of friends that they would do much ado about nothing scenes at Jaws's house on occasion. And they just thought that they would, they should, you know, put this on film. Hmm. Uh, everybody, you know, they've known each other for a long time. They would just improvise scenes and everything is filmed at Jaws's house. Right. And you, you know that these people are friends and that they have a, a really good connection between them. And it so it's, comes it's the rapport, camera. the rapport oh, yeah. that you enjoy. Okay. Now, why is that? Do you think? Why, why is rapport so enjoyable to watch? Yeah, why isn't it? I mean, you can tell when people get along and when they don't, but you know, it, it, it just, it gives that f- sense of feeling of, of a uh, belonging or family or friendship. Mm-hmm. And but watching watching be, people not get along is fun, also. Sometimes it can be, but yeah, it's a I'm different not, thing. I'm right? not much of a train wreck kind of person. Yeah, yeah. You know, reality TV show, any of that. I actually I haven't really watched broadcast TV for over well over a decade, so that's just really not a thing that I'm interested in. But man, yeah, just a, a really good friendship, a good dynamic between sure. people. Love it. Is it because it makes it feel like? it's possible or is it because is it is like a fantasy thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm actually genuinely curious. I'm wondering, mm. cause I'm the same way. I love watching competent people do stuff. I love watching people get along and yeah, rapport is a very attractive thing. And like, why is it, do you imagine placing yourself within that situation and hoping, or is it like, Oh, look, they can do it in their existence. Maybe I can do it in mine. Is it a, yeah, I'm curious. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, it's Shakespeare, first of all. So it's something that sure. I've, I've read in the past and, you know, being able to see them take a, a new, a, uh, more of a current twist on, on things. Right. I mean, it, it's, I don't know. It, it just it has a, a, a passion, a flavor of a, a, a speed that a lot of, uh, people won't. Uh, directors wouldn't wouldn't necess- necessarily take right right well i'll have to check it out sounds really cool yeah i just remember reading reviews and just seeing some clips seeing some clips and uh, thinking oh this looks really cool i will definitely check it out yes please now that we have you on here oh yeah i've never really heard you cuss what's your favorite swear word well, my favorite swear word is actually a Ukrainian word. Okay. And well, it's I mean it's it's the, the curse word that my my mom's father would say. And it's cholera, which is cholera. Right. And it's it was so sort of imbued within the culture, I guess, that it was used as a curse word. Like like you would, you know, like what in the name of cholera is going on? <laughs> you know, and I used to love to hear him say, you know, cholera, cholera, you know, that this thing could be a cholera, you know, like the stupid lock on the door wouldn't lock. And he would just say like, you know, God, this thing is being a cholera. I used to love that. So that, I think that's my favorite. That's my favorite curse word. But it's not really a curse word, but but for him and for me, it always was so. Yeah. Nice. And uh, in our, e- I sent you an email to try and get this all going here. And I was telling you, talking to you about food just a little bit, like a pierogies for me, a Polish food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have like a, did you get, get raised up with a U- Ukrainian version of it? Oh, yeah. It's called Pidohe. I mean, it's the same thing, basically. And it's that, yeah. I mean, every culture has its dumplings. Yeah. And uh, ours, you know, the Eastern European thing are these pierogies or Pidohe, which that's either, you know, potato stuffed or sauerkraut stuffed. Mm. There was a dessert version, too, that was kind of a blueberry stuffed. Mm. Um, but Christmas Eve was a big, uh, we call it the big beige food festival. There's no, there's no protein, which is very interesting, but it's all, it's stuffed cabbage. It's stuffed. It's uh, the pierogies, the pito here. Um, yeah. I mean, growing up, my mom's mom, uh, could make, uh, pito here like a machine and they were, <laughs> they were fantastic. And my mom still has the recipe and I've actually made, made them as well. A couple of Christmases ago, I made a, a bunch and I've made 
another thing that are called uh, ushke, which mm-hmm. literally is uh, ears. It translates to ears, and they're they're smaller um, stuffed um, ravioli type things, but it's with mushrooms, chopped and seasoned oh. mushrooms. And you put those into borscht, the oh, beet soup, yes. which you know Ukrainians eat borscht uh, oh, warm. Okay hot yeah. uh you know russian borscht is usually room temperature mm-hmm. yukes at mm-hmm. least at least from my upbringing we had it pretty hot and then especially christmas eve you put the ushka in there the, the ear dumplings and uh oh just yeah very 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 yummy uh, so ear pierogies though uh, were they boiled or baked Either way, I mean, uh, it, uh, really? usually boiled. If you're making okay, them like good. if you're making them to eat them right then and there, yeah. you would you would boil them, but like the next day, if you had leftovers, fry them up in a pan. Oh, yes. oh my gosh, nice and crispy. Oh, yes. That's it. That's yeah. it, man. I mean, yeah, the, I, the first day is great, but a little bit of uh, bacon grease in a frying pan the day after is just so amazing. Oh yeah, you get a little bit of little bit of you know caramelization happening on oh, it, a little yes. bit of crusting, and it's yeah, it's quite lovely, quite lovely. Man, what about galumkis? Have you ever heard of this? Well, is that that would be like holopchi? I, I would think it would be our thing, which is that's the stuffed cabbage. Uh, well, like we would do, like, yeah, cabbage rolls. Cabbage rolls, yeah. So, so stuff with rice and, yeah, uh, yeah rice, we'll pork, call them holopchi. Maybe beef. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Oh. We, yeah, not so much the beef thing, but it was the, yeah, my mom makes those for Christmas Eve as well. And, uh, she got to the point where she could make the, the cabbage nice and kind of still, um, you know, al dente. It wasn't yeah. totally soggy because if it's too soggy, it gets a bit m- mushy. Yeah, so she, you. she learned this process of kind of undercooking that stuff and you get this nice, not crispy, but there's a, there's a bite to it, a little bit of a firmness to it. And oh, mm. that's just wonderful stuff. Yeah. Just wonderful. This is so awesome. Cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that and stuff puppers. Oh my goodness. Uh, but um, <laughs> we used to do uh, plum dumplings. Uh, just roll out like little uh, eight inch uh, round tortilla size pieces of, of dough, uh, a plum, a little bit of sugar, a little. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Nice. Oil them. Nice. Oh, I don't mm-hmm. know. I, I'm, you can tell I'm hungry now. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had dinner yet either. So yeah, great. Yeah, man. Yeah, the Polish, the Polish and Ukrainian thing—it's very similar. I mean, it's even, even, even language-wise, because uh, my parents are from Western Ukraine on the border of Poland. Mm-hmm. The language that we speak, which is the Ukrainian, the Western Ukrainian from the '40s, sounds more Polish than the current Ukrainian sounds. Mm. Like current Ukrainian now from Ukraine, especially from the eastern parts of Ukraine, sounds very Russian to me. And uh, I took a couple of years of Russian in high school, and it's hard for me to understand sometimes people that have come over recently from Ukraine. And mm. to them, it sounds like I'm speaking Polish. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a softer oh, wow. kind of, yeah, it's interesting. So I can understand much more Polish than I sometimes think i can because of the sort of situational uh language uh that my parents were raised speaking which was this kind of m- somewhat modified ukrainian western ukrainian slash polish thing so yeah hmm. but you know to me it's obviously to me it's ukrainian and anything else sounds russian <laughs> <laughs> well and a lot of that would probably have to do with you know some of the old empires definitely the the whole russian uh shift of the last 60 years 70 years well yeah i mean the whole soviet i mean you you know that was part of the whole diaspora over here of the ukrainian Mm -hmm. culture that was in the states you know we were doing all the ukrainian stuff because we honestly didn't know if there was going to be a ukraine because Mm -hmm. the soviet union you know you weren't allowed to speak ukrainian all the schools were russian all the churches were switching over to russian any kind of ukrainian language stuff that was happening in ukraine from you know geez 1945 to 1991 in essence was was minimized and was illegal in many ways so so hmm. it was like our job, you know, and this was pounded into us. And this is why, you know, I was going to Ukrainian school. This is why I was going to Yuki Scouts. So there was a, and the Ukrainian church, there was a certain guilt of like, hey, it is your job because odds are this, you know, there's not going to be a Ukraine in another 20 years. Yeah. So that was unique to, to at least my 
diasporal experience. And I think that's why it was slightly different than, you know, my Italian friends or my Spanish friends who maybe had a grandmother that spoke Italian or Spanish, but they didn't quite have the same kind of fear that their culture was, was, you know, on the path to being erased. You might um, have something more in common with like your Jewish friends then where absolutely. Know, yeah. Keep yeah. Sure. Yeah. Alive and totally, totally. In terms of, especially, you know, from the, from the forties or fifties. Yeah. yeah. But in the midst of the cold war in the midst of the, you know, the evil empire, I mean, I, God, if you had asked me at, you know, as late as 1988, 87, you know, in three years, will the Soviet Union fall without a single shot being fired? I would have said no fucking way, like no way at all, never. And then it happened so quick. I mean, I was over there in 87. And then by the time I was a freshman in high school, it's like, I remember waking up my dad when, uh, the attempted coup happened hmm. uh, when they when they displaced Gorbachev and the mm-hmm. Politburo kind of mm-hmm. tried to get rid of him. And then Yeltsin stepped in and he was just like, nope, um, not going to happen. I remember waking up my dad saying, hey, they just they just kicked out Gorbachev. And like even then we didn't think, oh, this is the start of something. It was just like, oh, it's business as usual. You know, <laughs> Gorbachev has come in. Get selected. That was, yeah. yeah, Gorbachev came yeah. in, tried to open up some things, and they're going to get rid of him. But they couldn't do it because they couldn't control the information. You know, like people ask, <laughs> what was the cause of the fall of the Soviet Union? And it wasn't Reagan. It wasn't the Pope. It was the goddamn fax machine. You know, <laughs> it was the fax machine because you couldn't control the information. CNN yeah. was getting was literally getting faxes from people saying like, no, this is what's happening. You know? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing. Again, the technology running and, and, and determining history. And once you can't disseminate and control the information, you're fucked. And it's exactly what they learned. That's why all these you know regimes now, first thing they want to do is shut down the internet and shut down Twitter mm-hmm. and shut down all that stuff. Because if you control information, you can control people and, and, and communication yeah. especially. So The Egyptian so, yeah. government was overthrown by Facebook and Twitter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the future. You know, that's, that's, I, I think that's what gives me a little bit of hope for all, for e- even as bad as things are in some places is that you, you can't, you can't continually do it. You can't continually do it to the extent that you were able to control it 50, 100, 200 years ago, whatever, let alone even 10 years ago. So, you know, I think the revolutions that are, are that are going to happen in the next, not even century. I mean, in the next decade are going to be all informationally based. And, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 it's It's fascinating. fascinating. It's fascinating. So, so yeah. So to be, to, to be raised speaking Ukrainian with the idea, you know, my sister, uh, my sister jokingly said when the, when the Soviet union dissolved, my sister jokingly said, can we speak English now? You know, (laughs) which was only half true. I mean, it's like we did our, we did our job. We did our job. It was kind of cool, you know? Um, so that now was I'd, that was the purpose, yeah. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the current Ukrainian civil war. Uh, you know, th- that's the next thing is like I had to almost divest myself because I was just burnt out. You know, when the whole Maidan thing happened um, a year, two years ago, a year and a half ago, whatever that was. Um, it, <sighs> I've I've been burnt so many t- so many times, uh, you know. Soviet Union falls, yay! Free Ukraine, awesome! We did it, you know. Celebration, yay! Within five years, it's like covered in corruption and all kinds of horribleness, and they're trying to depose and get rid of people. And then there was the Orange Revolution that happened about whatever that was ten years ago, and it was like, yay! Yushchenko's in there, and they got rid of him, and then they poisoned him, and he got you know, and it's like, ah, uh, and then your heart breaks again, and then something else happens, and then oh, that thing falls apart and your heart breaks again and then this whole Maidan thing started happening and then the the Crimean invasion and and I had to be like I can't I can't I I am I'm done like I I my cousin conversely like completely got into it and was watching CNN 24 hours a day and was online was watching the live satellite camera feed from from Kiev and and ended up doing this entire art project about it that was beautiful and just moving but i i i kind of had to go i'm out i'm out i i can't have my heart broken again <laughs> i just i like i i sort of realized like that i have I have less to do with the Ukrainians that are there now than mm-hmm. I ever have. And I, I can't. <laughs> so I, I check in occasionally, but I have friends that are very into it and I totally understand them being into it. But, um, 
yeah, I'm like a, I'm like, it's like a bad relationship. I just have to kind of walk away at this point. Maybe at some point I'll jump back in or maybe I'll, maybe I'll be like, you know, the person that becomes the fan when their team enters the Super Bowl when there's good news. <laughs> but I, I just, yeah, I, I, I at this point now, I, I, I had to divest myself of, of the emotional part of it because I just, I can't have my heart broken again, <laughs> which I know is, I know is that going to happen, you know, for as much good news and as much bad news that kind of comes out of there, you know. I mean, Chernobyl happens when I'm a kid. Oh, that's yeah, it's everything. Like, yeah, before even before the Soviet Union falls, you know, it's like the first the first knowledge people have of of Ukraine being its own place is when the worst nuclear accident in the history of the planet <laughs> happens. You know, in, in essence, in my hometown, it's like, oh, great. So yeah, <laughs> so that's that's yeah. the history, the twisted history I have with my culture and my people. And I just by this point, I was like, I can't, I can't. So we'll see. Ask me again in a year. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. But it's safe to say it's a fucked up situation. Oh, it's completely fucked up. It's it's incredibly fucked up. Yeah, it's incredibly fucked up and just sad and just and I I for you know, from what I know of what's going on, it's hard to imagine there being a solution without a lot of pain and suffering. But yeah. I said that in 1987 as well, so who knows? Who knows? Yeah, you know, there's already been a lot of pain and suffering and bloodshed. Oh god, yeah. 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 So we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, we are out of time. Yeah. And you're okay. both hungry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you have to plug? Uh, hey, if you go to geologicpodcast.com, you can come hear my show. Uh, if you go to georgehrab.com or if you just Google H-R-A-B, you can sort of find out what I'm all about. You can get my tunes on my music on iTunes. And if you happen to be in New York City in May, especially May 12th, you should come to Nexus. N-E-C-S-S dot O-R-G because it's a wonderful conference. Uh, Bill Nye is talking and uh, Richard Weissman is going to be giving a keynote and it's going to be a wonderful weekend. And we kick off the entire weekend with uh, my composition called The Broad Street Score, which is uh, 20 years worth of music um, repackaged and represented. So come to that. Otherwise, just uh, go to, uh, you know, the Skeptic's Guide. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're, they, they're, they're much better than any of us. So there you go. All right. And the links to all that will be in the show notes. Fantastic. All righty. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, and guys. It was fun. For our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.